Um, so I'm going to start out just because there are a few of you here who really know nothing about Yokeo biofuels. I'm going to I'm going to start out with a little bit of company history and, and how we got started because actually it is all relevant to the topic that I'm going to be talking talking about, which is steps toward a 100 mile diet for your car. Um, how many of you saw the film last night, by the way? Um, cool. So, so if I reference that, all right. Um, I also wrote a little joke when, when we were done watching Josh's film last night that I want to share with everybody. Because um, we start these things off with jokes, right? How many environmentalists does it take to change a light bulb? Does anybody know? OK, two. One to explain how it's not the light bulb that needs changing, it's society. And the other to pull out the incandescent and put in the LED. <laughs> I kind of feel like, you know, I. We all fall into that. And we, you know, last night was like, I, I, I fall into it as well. There's so much kind of details being discussed that it's easy to, to forget that we're all working on the big picture. So my pet project over the last few years has been to kind of move away from the idea of sustainable biodiesel, which used to be my pet phrase that I was really big on sustainable biodiesel. I belonged to the National Body Sports Task Force for a little while and felt that I could help steer the industry towards sustainability. Um, in recent years, I've come to realize that sustainability is such a weird, many-headed beast that folks all define differently that I wanted to narrow it down to something that really solves just about every problem in my opinion, which is localization. And, um, you know, yesterday on the panel we heard from a representative of the Transition Town Movement. Um, there's a lot of other movements to localize all kinds of resources. And to me, the localization of biodiesel is, is something that if we can accomplish it, it'll be a long-term project. Um, it involves a lot more parts than I think people realize. And um, I'm really excited about it. I, I hope to one day um, have, a, have a fuel that is made up of local inputs and that the outputs go into the local community and that basically the whole use the whole buffalo concept, you know, apply, apply to fuel. Um, so I started Yokea okay Biofuels about 10 years ago. Our 10 year anniversary is actually coming up in October and we've been so busy that we don't have anything planned to celebrate it. Okay. <laughs> Terrified because we have a shareholders meeting scheduled for October and we're not like planning some giant party, which I feel like we should be. But um, 10 years ago, biodiesel was not a household word. Um, I feel like not only has it become a household word in the meantime, but it's gone through this whole cycle of everybody got excited, then um, as we talked about last night, everybody got depressed, and now we're kind of finding our way in the wilderness. Um, but uh, back when I got into it, um, it, it was you know, a really neat idea that I, I did first read about in an old version of Josh DeKell's book, From the Fire Fuel Tank. Um, I, has anybody here ever seen the, the yellow cover, uh, spiral bound, inkjet printed version of that book? <laughs> Sweet. All right, um, collector's edition. And unfortunately, mine is gone. But. Um, my wife, Sonny, worked at Real Goods back in the 90s in Berkeley, and at their outlet store, which ceased existing a long time ago, they had a copy of this for like 50 cents. So I picked up, picked up a copy and read it and was blown away by the fact that although I didn't have a car then, someday I could buy a Volkswagen bus and do the really cool hippie road trip across the country and make my own fuel and all that. So I, made a little plan, put it on the wall to inspire myself, and that was kind of that. Um, Berkeley actually started doing amazing things. Um, uh, Dave Williamson at the Ecology Center got Berkeley's recycling truck, trucks on 100% biodiesel before a lot of folks in the National Biodiesel Board and, and elsewhere thought that you could even run anything on 100% biodiesel. I remember people saying what he was doing was impossible. Um, and ultimately, I think through a combination of politics and other things, he was foiled for a while, but he was a very early adopter of 100% of biodiesel. Then, of course, Biofuel Oasis got started, really showing the way with this women-owned collective. 
Um, and then recently, a few years ago, moving into a fancy new station, and, and finally, you know, after years of developing biodiesel in California, we've actually got a station kind of, you know, in this in the same type of, of trend setting and, and really moving the bar upward as what's happened with the stations in like Eugene with sequential biofuels. We've, we've got a solar powered biodiesel station that sells chicken feed and honey bee supplies right right in Berkeley. So so um, there's definitely a movement that we that we came out of and I had I had started out with very, very, you know, seemingly high goals at the time, but looking back on them, ridiculously tiny goals, which were to sell a thousand gallons of biodiesel a month someday, um, and and to talk about biodiesel on my favorite radio show, which is Democracy Now. So when, when both of those goals had happened in 2002, because <laughs> <laughs> Andy Goodman came to Soul Fest at the Soil Living Institute in, in Hopland, which is a where I was, I was living at the time, I've been moving from Berkeley, I kind of had to get serious. Um, and stole Sunny from Real Goods, my wife, uh, to join our company. And interestingly enough, um, the reason that Sunny's not here right now at this conference is because just a few days ago, she ended her tenure at, at UK Biofuels in a very planned manner. Her, her age of, of building the company with me is, is no longer needed, and she is rejoicing in her fun employment. <laughs> so so uh, we, we went a very different route than, than companies normally go, and I think it's given us a very unique window on the industry. Um, we started out as a marketer. We built a B100 market. Um, I'm a very stubborn idealist. And I refuse to believe all the people who told me I can't make a market with D100, that you can't use 100% biodiesel in diesel cars. I was using it, and I figured if I'm using it, other people can use it, I want to make it available. So we started with the B100 market. Then a few years into that, when we started running into problems with suppliers, we got some bad fuel from a large fuel supplier. Um, they're one of the California pioneers of biodiesel, Girl Mark, was at the National Biodiesel Conference in, in uh, Palm Springs years ago, running around with the <laughs> famous vial of goo, showing that people that home brewers don't make bad biodiesel, big biodiesel companies make bad biodiesel. And we, we got one of those loads. Um, test results had either been doctored or erroneously put on the, on the certificate of analysis. And that was one of the big signs that we needed to get into fuel production ourselves. So. Um, to, to get there, you know, we weren't going to go out and get millions of dollars from BC because we weren't promising any kind of proprietary technology. So we got started the only way we could, which was getting into restaurant oil collection and uh, started building that up. So again, in kind of keeping with this backwards way of approaching it, we built our biodiesel market, then we started grease collection. And finally, um, in the fall of 2005, we got started on small commercial batches of, of biodiesel. Um, four, four years in to, to our, our business. And usually a lot of companies will start out with a production plan. They'll raise a lot of money through a technology-based um, kind of rallying of excitement. And then they've got this really big, fancy biodiesel production plant that was the end result of all of this stir-up press release enthusiasm. And who knows what's going to happen with the, uh, with the feedstock prices, the oil prices, right? So, so you get a 2 million gallon capacity, 10 million gallon capacity, 20 million gallon capacity plant, and all of a sudden it's not economical to make biodiesel out of any of the chosen feedstocks for that plant. So I feel like by going backwards, we were able to kind of avoid some of those, some of those pitfalls. And we also got to a point where we didn't have to worry about uh, setting up these arrangements with uh, wholesale uh, you know, big fleet users, um, all, all kinds of things where we would be selling indirectly through a bunch of middlemen to, to get to the end user. And so ever since we've been producing, we've had a neat relationship where we're selling wholesale through Biofuel Oasis, they're selling a lot of our fuel, but otherwise we're selling directly to the end users. And I, I, again, I, 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 I want to explain all this because I think it's kind of led us to where we are in our understanding of, of local fuel. Um, so, so I just want to start out by, by going over like what our idea of local fuel is. Um, so California, and I'm not the artist I once was, so 
forgive me, but you know, California does its thing. And here's the San Francisco Bay Area, and Ukiah, where we're based, is like up here. And we basically collect used cooking oil from the restaurants in a six, seven county area north of San Francisco, which is right there, um, and a little bit to the east and, and up to the Napa Valley where there's some amazing restaurants. And importantly, anybody who's got um, Indian casinos nearby, gigantic sources of grease in, in Indian casinos. So um, this has kind of become the, the area that that sustains us with, with uh, used fire oil. And its boundary is basically dictated by where we can get to easily and do 25 routes in a day, or 25 stops in a day, um, and still you know, miss the commute, make sure we have everything in a 10 hour day. So what we've found is that for the most part, and that's a really horrible circle drawn around you kind of, yeah. <laughs> The idea is, is that we're basically within a 100 mile radius. That's just kind of come about through how we've had to do stuff. Um, with with uh, all of the ocean here, we know we have a little bit of space to work with if we're talking, you know, as the crow flies, we can push out a little further. But the 100 mile radius has just kind of happened accidentally, and that's how I came to think of it as a 100 mile diet. And this is something that I've been, I've been thinking about for a long time now. As far as biodiesel, because our biodiesel deliveries are normally many fewer stops. They're far quicker. I mean, dropping biodiesel on the customers is such an easier operation than collecting used fryer oil from a restaurant. We could actually probably go a lot further um, from that 100 mile circle uh, with biodiesel if, if we wanted to, if that, was, if that was how we wanted to do things. But as, as part of this effort to become sustainable and then realizing that it's an effort to become local, we realized that we don't really want to collect we, we don't really want to sell biodiesel to places that we don't collect oil from. And we don't really want to collect oil to places that we don't sell biodiesel to. I think that long term there's a lot of marketing sense behind that strategy. But I also think that um, if we're trying to build a community um, and we're trying to actually get to the bottom of what it means to, to do the most ecologically correct fueling operation we can, then we should really be selling fuel where we're not sourcing the inputs for that fuel. So this is one of the first steps that I feel like we really completed in, in getting toward local fuel, is kind of defining the radius and making that commitment to not collect from where we don't sell and not sell, sell to where we don't collect from. Um, we're at a very interesting point in our development right now where we're about to go to the edge and a little bit outside of the circle to hit up another highway corridor that we haven't really done much with before. And it was a moment of reckoning since we had committed so much to this 100 mile diet, you know, are we okay with going outside of it? And this whole idea that so much of our 100 mile circle was ocean kind of convinced us that, okay, we can, we can afford to do that. But we took it very seriously. Um, Lyle was talking about having a very activist board. And I think we are moving more in that direction. Um, a lot of our shareholders and <coughs> the people in our company want to see our company become a collectively owned uh, business eventually. It's going to be a crazy transition, I'm sure, getting there from where we are at right now. But all of the businesses that we're really inspired by operate that way. We've recently done some consulting with Alvarado Street Bakery to kind of learn more about that and also to learn more about operating um, depots for grease collection because as we expand, we're going to have to be doing some of that. Um, so so uh, right now, a lot of these activist decisions and kind of building the ideals into our business plan are, are being made by our management team. You know, this is not coming down from people outside the company. Um, in our board of directors. This is, this is something that we're doing in-house. And there's a lot of kind of training within the company um, to, to uh, move away from the typical business school approach, which is generally a very short-term profit, toward kind of a long-term, like, what, what we're developing thing here. And so I, I can sometimes get a little bit too idealist. I can sometimes get a little bit too stubborn about this. Um, but but uh, it's become part of part of our, our planning process. 
Um, one of one of the an example of, of uh, one of the ways that I've been a little bit too stubborn and idealist in the past is that I've really held off on on doing blends for years and years and years. I didn't want to sell diesel, and we're, we've just at this point realized that. If we're going to expand our oil collection, to expand the production, to expand our sales, which we need to do to make ourselves, to give ourselves staying power in case these subsidies all go away. Because frankly, I feel like any biodiesel supplier right now, especially producers, you need to be ready for the subsidies all being gone. I mean, the RINs might seem like they're going to stay around for a while, but the, the dollar tax incentive could be, could be gone at the end of this year. We're treating it like it will be. Um, so as we're working on strategy for how we develop staying power, I've had to finally admit that, that we're going to need to sell blends, and um, that's going to involve a lot of things. Um, but um, getting getting back to, to the the local and, and what what getting there means for for Yokeo, I want to I want to talk a little bit about how that affects some of the ingredients, some of the process, um, and some of the direction we're moving in. Um, historically, we have not had the type of R&D focus that, that folks at Piedmont have, or that a lot of the articles that you'll read in Biodiesel Magazine focus on. Um, because we've been kind of building this thing out of an already existing market, and because of the, our approach, I mean, we've really been just kind of having to respond to operational needs for a really long time. Um, and now with, with uh, the resources that we've gotten in, in, the, in the past year, because the winds have, have gotten to the point where they're actually bringing in some, some real money, because the tax incentive is back, this is our big year for, for, for reinvestment. So it's kind of like all those years where we weren't taking advantage of government grants, um, and, and we're feeling woefully inadequate. Um, now we've got a chance to focus on R&D. So some of the ways we're doing that um, are on, on feedstock, we're, we're working on collecting oil from, from more restaurants, um, but we're also trying to, uh, to find out what other feedstocks we can develop locally, um, realizing that our existing management team and the existing business structure can't really address that. The oil collection manager is spending so much time putting out fires for restaurants um, that, that you really need um, some kind of other position. You really need somebody whose focus can be dedicated to alternative feedstocks. So we're going to be opening up an alternative feedstock coordinator position. Um, ultimately, this person's job is going to be agricultural um, in large part, but also sourcing unique um, types of oil. Lyle, you've mentioned uh, some of the interesting oils you guys get, I think almond oil, various, various lower quality FFA things. Um, having, having a dedicated staff to that is something that we've realized we absolutely need. And um, I was just, just uh, speaking with someone a few moments ago about one of the resources that we have nearby that I didn't realize was local until a few years ago, which is a stand of Chinese salad trees. So um, right at a hardware store downtown in Ukiah, we actually have in the parking lot, um, many years ago, ornamental Chinese salad trees were planted and they seed out every uh, fall um, little little white clusters that are tallow on the outside and oil on the inside. And we've started doing a little research on them. We have a smaller version of the oil press that Piedmont Biofuels has. We started collecting data on that. Um, and uh, we look forward to um, hopefully getting enough data in that we can start a test program with uh, trellising some Chinese tallow trees in order to hopefully mechanically harvest them at some point. The, the claims with any big yield oil producing crop are always you know, all over the place, oftentimes way inflated. So we don't really know what to expect. We're hoping for more than what you would get with sunflowers or canola or rapeseed, mustard, all of the traditional stuff. Um, we're hoping that we make it a few hundred gallons an acre, which to me is key for, for any local crop that you're going to grow. Um, if you're trying to stay within a community model, again, you know, it's what, what scale is the community scale? So I'd like to see some kind of crop rotation, grow things together. Um, could we do something with uh, Chinese tallow and mustard together? Um, could we even throw in some ethanol crops potentially in the long run, like Jerusalem artichokes or, or uh, 
Um, one that I've been learning about recently is um, what's the stuff that's in uh, New Orleans coffee? Um, chicory. chicory. Chicory is apparently a pretty good source of inulin for an alternative to Jerusalem artichoke. So various things that might be able to be planted um, together, along with things like bees for a, for a kind of more full cir circle business model. In our area, so much of the cropland is already dedicated to, to wine grapes. And while it seems that that industry is on the decline right now, I mean, this land is extremely valuable. So it's not just a matter of food versus fuel. It's a matter of how do we get the most possible yield of the most possible stuff out of this land. So this is one of the things we're looking at for, for feedstocks for this alternative feedstock coordinator position. Um, obviously, another thing that we're up against is um, alcohol. Uh, how do we eventually get to a local alcohol? This feels like one of those things that a lot of our industry hasn't even wanted to think about yet. I mean, we're definitely all living in the methanol reality at the moment. But it is a, bit, a very vulnerable point for our industry because obviously methanol will go up and down in price depending on heating demands, natural gas uh, issues going on around the world. Since there's so few plants creating so much methanol, what happens if one of them shuts down? Um, certainly whenever methanol is skyrocketed in price, it's impacted us horribly. So there's a lot of economic reasons for switching to a local alcohol. Um, there's also a lot of other, you know, sustainability reasons for switching to another type of alcohol. Methanol is extremely dangerous. Everybody always cracks up that we've got a bottle of vodka in our fridge at work as part of our medicine kit. But it's because methanol is deadly and we take it very seriously that if somebody gets, gets methanol poisoning at our work, we got to administer something right away while we get the ambulance there. Um, it hasn't happened yet. We've been very good with methanol and I don't expect it to, but it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Um, and ethanol is much safer. We've looked at ethanol for local alcohol. We've looked at, at butanol for local alcohol. A friend of mine is in, is in the enzyme industry, and one of the things that they were looking at is enzymes for making cellulosic ethanol. And then I believe it was a, a bacteria that they could use in a similar process for making butanol, which was really exciting to me because if we had butyl esters, it would be like totally cold proof. Um, that unfortunately looks like it's a longer ways away, but ethanol can be made in, in much lower tech processes than the cellulosic ethanol that people are talking about. So to me, it's kind of a more accessible local alcohol. So we're trying to work, again, kind of backwards right now. We're trying to, uh, to work on the process to tailor it so that we can use ethanol. And then once we've got the ability to be making ethyl esters, biodiesel, um, be able to uh, work on generating local ethanol in our community. And uh, again, one of, I mean, I, I always talk about Piedmont Biofuels and how I'm a big fan, but one of the things that I'm really appreciating right now is the work that you guys are doing with enzymes because it's enabling us to look at things like ethyl esters from a different perspective. Um, one of our engineers right now has been doing work on, on uh, using methylates to create ethyl esters with a more traditional process and enzymes for making ethyl esters. And I've been continuously amazed at how easy it is to make biodiesel out of ethanol. I had always believed that it was a really difficult, you know, high barrier of entry type of thing, that you had to have the driest oil in the world, that you'd have all kinds of problems afterwards, you need to recover your alcohol, um, that, that ethanol costs a lot, and there would be all these issues that you'd have to use way more. And a lot of these things have been shot down to, to, um, to some respect. Um, we're also very lucky in California that we've got access to ethanol in ways that I think other places don't necessarily. Obviously, you've got corn ethanol all over the United States and in the Midwest. But where we are, we've also got a company called Parallel Products down in Southern California that makes their ethanol by recycling beverage industry waste, among other things. So we've got access to a really desirable low, uh, or, or sorry, high energy balance um, source for our alcohol. And we've also got access to, to companies like Pacific Ethanol, who, uh, who should be able to give us a little bit more staying power, perhaps. And so we've got primary and secondary sources. So that's really exciting to me. Um, additionally, obviously, when you're making biodiesel, you need to look at catalysts, unless you're using a supercritical process, which, again, in the, 
in the path toward localizing everything, we've we've explored that as well. Um, our folks, uh, our friends up in, in Chico, um, have been working on supercritical methanol biodiesel for a very long time in an effort to make biodiesel without catalysts. They're trading catalysts for high heat and high pressure. And they've successfully made ASTM biodiesel um, in a supercritical method with this sort of incredible heat exchanger continuous process, very tiny tube that a, a small amount of biodiesel is continuously coming out, but over the course of a day, it's actually quite a large amount. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's a number of barriers to entry that they're working their way through, but that's something we're keeping an eye on that could also work with ethanol um, and other alcohols. Um, but assuming that we're not going to go super critical, which, I mean, that, for folks who know a little bit about it, I mean, that's kind of one of those far away algae type things, um, we need to be looking at catalysts. What are we going to do about a local catalyst? Um, a lot of folks who have <coughs> researched potassium hydroxide, um, caustic soda, caustic potash, understand that it has its roots in a very primitive, simple process. That you can take hardwood ash, white, white ash, and you can soak that in water to make lye. And then purifying it is a matter of essentially kind of concentrating that and concentrating that and concentrating that. Very few people have done that. It's something I've thought about bringing into our company. There's, there's dangers involved. There's a lot of issues involved with that. And ultimately, you're still left with the problems of a very dirty biodiesel process that relies on that, on that catalyst. So we've been looking at using other catalysts, um, including using enzymes. Um, seems like the only trace from our, from our work so far that, again, we've been, we've been kind of working based on Piedmont's research and in tandem with them. Um, it seems that the only trace that enzymes leave is dead enzymes. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, I think ultimately, when, when you're working with something like enzymes, another local concern com comes into play, which is, you know, I'm always trying to look big picture with this, and I want to ultimately have kind of a closed circle where we can do everything ourselves. And if we're relying on a global corporation for an enzyme, what happens if they decide they don't want to sell to us anymore? Or, or before we even get to that point, they don't want to work with Piedmont. Or, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with that relationship. Uh, what if they go out of business? Um, you know, a lot of people would say, well, a global corporation is never going to go out of business, but we all know better. Um, so I'm interested in, in looking at licensing agreements, um, possibly paying more for the ability to make it ourselves, if we can have like legal contracts that allow us that, that freedom, because it'll give us staying power if the worst case scenario happens. I think it's all really important because ultimately there's so many reasons for us to control our fuel supply and there's all these little points at which you lose control and, and they worry me. Um, these, are, these are things that don't worry a lot of the folks that I work with because they're not operational concerns, but as the CEO I get to think about this stuff. Um, and so eliminating them Getting to the point where we are removed from the pressures of the commodity market, this has become a, a huge goal for me. Um, the fact that so many sustainable, ecological issues, concerns are solved at the same time is, is almost a bonus. I want to get to a point where I can price my fuel based on the cost of making the fuel. And that's really hard to do when you're depending on all of these commodity markets. I mean, there's always gonna be, I mean, for most of our lifetime, there's all, if not, you know, every day that all of us are alive, there's always gonna be more diesel and gasoline than there is biofuel. So we've got an inherent supply and demand issue where, yes, we might be able to offer biodiesel cheaper than diesel at one moment, but then somebody's gonna swoop in, buy that up, take it away from my customers that I've invested all my time in teaching them about how to use biodiesel, and so I have to keep biodiesel priced a little higher regardless of all these other factors that dictate where my pricing is gonna be. And I think that ultimately, one of the greatest things about localizing the, the inputs for making the fuel is that, is that when you remove them from the pressure of the commodity markets, you can actually price your fuel without respect to supply and demand. You've got a completely different set of factors. And I think as a, as a 
transition to that, one of the things I'm looking forward to, um, and it's not certainly not finalized yet, we're not even selling blends yet, but I really like the idea of, of starting to get pricing based on that, where when we're doing blends, we've talked about offering B20, B50, and B100, and starting to kind of train our market to understand the supply and demand issues, one of the ways we can do that is by offering a B20 product that's slightly cheaper than petroleum diesel, a B50 product that's basically priced the same as petroleum diesel in our community, and a B100 product or B9929 product that's slightly more expensive than, than diesel in our community. Um, I think ultimately that can kind of help the market work toward thinking about, about where this, this whole supply chain is and, and the pressures and move away from this complete um, mismatch and understanding about these issues between the market and, and you know, where we're coming from with our goals as we're moving forward. Um, so I talked a little bit about the inputs. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the outputs. Obviously, there's, there's the biodiesel itself. Um, in our process right now, we generate wash water and we generate what people call glycerin, but it's not really. I mean, it's maybe 20, 25% glycerin. It's mostly just a crude toxic soup. And obviously, shipping, as we currently do with our crude toxic soup glycerin, we currently ship that out to a, to a rendering company that's far away from us who has the tools to, to work with that, to actually get some value out of it, to basically do some of the biorefining that, that they do in, in Piedmont. Um, but we're losing a lot of value. Again, there's the economic issue there. We're, we're not really being true to our community in that regard. I mean, we're not keeping the dollars local. Um, we are trusting, I mean, we send MSDS as we've gone over everything with this other company, but we're trusting that this other company is fulfilling their end of the bargain. There's a lot of danger tied up in that. Um, additionally, on the wash water that comes out of our process, um, it, what we have right now is what I consider a very tenuous arrangement with the city of Ukiah, where we're outsourcing our, our, our wash water treatment to them. Um, you know, we're, we're on their list of companies that are doing that. It's, it's kind of a, a handshake and this is working so far type of deal with them, but I feel like that could come out um, from under us at any point. And I feel like we need to eliminate these, these waste streams to make ourselves a stronger business. So regardless of where we go with enzymes or other processes, we need to eliminate creating wash water just to make our company stronger because as we grow, we're currently at 20 employees. Last year we were down at 10 at one point. Um, you know, we can't have all these people's livelihoods, all these shareholders' investments in our companies, you know, depending on one little tenuous arrangement that if it's gone, we're, we're totally screwed. So again, looking for the transition, um, we're currently working on taking that, that wash water and, and sending it to EV Mud for their methane digester, which we don't have locally in Ukiah, but it's still local enough and productive enough that it represents a big step forward from, from what's going on, where currently our, our, uh, our wash water goes, goes to the local water treatment plant, our glycerin goes hundreds of miles away. We're looking at combining those two streams and sending it to EV Mud, East Bay Mud, which is our, our, our big water treatment plant down in the Bay Area, for becoming methane, which is actually really exciting. And you know, methane is, is a very usable, renewable fuel in that case. Um, What's your ratio of wash water to fuel? Um, our ratio of wash water to fuel is actually a lot lower than, than you know, some, some ways of doing it out there. I think bubble washing actually gets it even better than we do. But we're doing about uh, 250 gallons per batch each day. We do, we do three washes. So for a 1,400 gallons of oil batch, we're doing about 750 gallons of water total. Okay. Yeah, and it, and it does get the fuel very clean to where the soap levels, um, you know, we, we shoot for 50 parts per million soap. There's not really an ASTM standard for soap, but, you know, we using potassium um, catalyst, uh, that, that seems to be where, where, we, where we want it to be to, to hit the ASTM standard for ash, I believe it is. Um, we don't dry wash as well. One of the sticking points for a long time that that, uh, that we've been trying to work up to dealing with is to dry wash, it seems like you need a couple with methanol recovery. And so once we got to the point where we were ready to finally buy a methanol recovery system, we started seeing these alternatives where, hey, maybe we won't need methanol recovery. 
so we're investigating those right now. But um, it's dry wash is something that we we didn't want to just jump into because it seemed like there were some issues with it, and um, and water just works. On the other hand, I recently had a fuel load uh, shipped back to us um, because it had water in it, and. Uh, they're figuring out right now, hopefully they've figured it out already, how that got there because it's not supposed to be possible in our plant process. So water's always going to have problems. We have a dehydrator. We test it with Carl Fisher to make sure it's under 500 parts per million. We have several checkpoints so that by the time it's in our truck, there should be no way that it's not dry. But, but uh, I, do, I do think that concerns about wash water um, disposal aside, there's inherent issues with using water. Um, it's hard to... It's hard to move away from what works. So, so again, we're kind of going backwards in, in that regard, from, from the ease of entry, stuff that works, toward the really exciting stuff that works even better. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that by presenting this all to you in kind of like this, this long narrative format that I'm not boring, boring everybody with, with like a wall of text <laughs> vocal version here, but um, I'm going to open it up for questions in, in just a couple of moments. I just kind of wanted to proceed through through a few things. Um, I, I think that one of the things that we all have to ask ourselves, in addition to just solving all of the operational problems proactively, reactively, whatever the case may be, is why are we doing this? And for me, the reason I'm doing this the reason I got into it in the first place was because there was a way to use renewable fuel and I wanted my community to have access to it. And the extension of that now that my community has access to it is I want that fuel to really help my community. And when I'm buying methanol from, well it used to be Ashland and now it's Nexio and they're gigantic and we have no personal contact with them except once in a while their rep comes and brings us pizza. Um, it's like that's that's relationship is not helping our community. When I send the, the glycerin out to a commodity company that we had to pick one that was far enough away from us that we could have a business deal with them because hey they're a renderer and otherwise we'd be competing with them, you know that's not helping my community. Working with someone really far like that, um, all of these little you know for for lack of a better word, I'm using this term metaphorically. Everybody flashpoints. <laughs> You know, I, I feel like we need to address all of them. And there are so many stages in the process where we don't really have control, community control. And so I think if we want to really go further and we want to really extend the mission of, of making the fuel accessible and helping our community, we need to address each of these. And so my intention today was to bring up some of the areas of focus we have in addressing that concern but I also think that you know we are very insulated, and we do need to come together more. And I think this is a, one of those things where a brain trust really does help. And I hope that maybe you all agree with me that these are things we're thinking about, worth adding to the to the mission, to the visioning process, and ultimately worth solving. So that's pretty much my spiel at this point. Um, you know, I I may have lost over a few things, and if, and if you feel I did, I hope you, you call me on it and we talk about it a little bit more. But um, I want to get the conversation started on how to really localize all of this process. And when I say process, I don't just mean the actual production plant process. I mean everything that we're concerned with. And I want to hear your ideas on it. Okay, um, Dan? Well, just to add to your point, overall this is what <coughs> Uh, what went wrong with the industry in, uh, in 05, 06, and 07. It became so diverse and dependent on all these outside economic things that it, it really fell. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've always been about the local economy. To keep something in your economy, especially fuel, fuel or food, um, it enriches it dramatically. And uh, it's completely the right way to go. Well, and it, and it blows my mind that it's so easy for people to understand the idea of victory gardens and like front yard gardens and all of that, but that we seem so far away from the same, applying the same thinking toward fuel. And I think part of that might be that the organic farming industry has such a head start and that we've got so many 
worldwide examples. I, I mean, Cuba is such a perfect example of what communities can do with gardening. And it's not a big leap to go from that to fuel. We just need to realize that there's some parallels there. Yeah, and the competitor to them. Uh, come on, a couple of things. Um, it, it seems that ethanol is kind of, to my mind, almost the holy grail of, of biodiesel. Especially when you look at alternative methanol and all the inherent problems, um, you know, the toxicity and the fact that we're relying on this, as you say, this uh, global commodity. Um, I don't know that much about it, but it sounds like what you said is that you don't think ethanol is that problematic. I mean, is this directly from what you've done? Because to me, that's, that's great news. Uh, well, yeah, that's, and, that's and we're still at the very beginning stages of it. Um, again, I approached biodiesel in the beginning from home brewer bill. I mean, I was well, making that's, that's I yeah, I was making small batches, and I was on Infopop. I, I, how, how many? I, I just got to know how many people have been on biodiesel Infopop's forum. Okay, cool. So it's still alive and kicking. Great. Um, and it always seemed like the ethanol thing was so much harder um, that, that unless you really had a great source for it or were willing to work with E85 or you know, were a chemist or something, that it just presented bar barriers to entry. And especially for a commercial producer, the thing that always got me was the recovery. Um, you, even if you recover your ethanol, you're going to have a less pure ethanol than what you needed to make the fuel at the beginning. That always seemed like a gigantic barrier to entry for me. So if, if, you, uh, if you find a good process that solves enough of the economics, you might be able to go with kind of an enhanced recovery process. Or you look for a process that doesn't need recovery. And you know these are the things we're looking at. Um, we'll, Will they be successful? If, if they're not successful in those regards, they're going to be successful in other ways because they're teaching us a whole lot right now. Well, it's part two of my question is, um, talking about what you do with your, your byproduct of this, and you know, from what Lyle was saying this morning about monetizing every part of what you have, you know, I mean, I remember an old phrase, waste is not waste until you waste it. So you're saying basically, you, you have this waste, it's got to be, how does that, how can you manage to operate when part of your bottom line is basically wasted? Well, one of the things is, thank you, Grady. Um, one of the things is obviously the economics right now are different than they've been at other times. Um, and they are encouraging us to be wasteful because it's so easy to still make money right now. Um, but we're having to look beyond that, and it's not easy. <laughs> But uh, you know, it's not easy pulling everybody at the plant into this discussion because they all just want to do what they're doing and solve problems the way that they've been taught to. But um, there's, you know, there's more than economic costs, and that's what we're having to look at. Also, with the with the ethanol, another thing that I failed to mention is if we had to be moving forward as wasteful as we are right now, like if we just run into brick walls on everything else, I'd rather have ethanol in my waste stream than methanol. So if the economics otherwise pan out, you know, that is a consideration. Methanol is really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm shameful and embarrassed by the fact that we're, we're reliant on it. Um, what do you guys do for home delivery? I think you guys deliver to people the B100 in drums or something. Something I've heard of for the years and something I'd really like to do myself. Do you have any documentation or anything like that that you can share over time? As far as how, how that works? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from the very beginning, literally for the whole 10 years we've been in operation, um, we've been delivering to storage setups that we set up for folks. It's like propane companies do, um, where they'll set up a, a tank and go and fill it for you off of their, off their trip. Um, we set up a storage system, do a little bit of training with the customers to make sure that they understand how to use the storage system, place it properly and all that. Whether it's barrels, we use plastic 55 gallon drums, um, and farm tanks for a lot of folks, uh, which are really common in our area, it's rural. Um, there's a lot of problems with that, so I'd like to believe that over time we're gonna move away from that part of our business model and toward more retail pumps, um, because we've got, you know, essentially hundreds of, of folks out there with storage setups, and a decent percentage of those 
at times it seems like the majority of them are gonna have problems with storage at some point, just because they're not professional fuel storers. We are. When people fill up at our, at our retail pumps, they don't have problems. When they fill up at their own pump over and over and over and over again, someday they're gonna have a problem probably, because a little bit of stuff will build up in the bottom, maybe they left a cap off and there's some bugs down there or something growing. I mean, who knows? There's all kinds of things that can happen. And water will find a way into a lot of storage setups. We refresh our retail pump tanks all the time. We keep them pretty small size, so we're doing that. Um, a lot of folks don't really listen to my recommended two month fuel storage setup, and they'll store their fuel for a year, and lots of stuff, lots of stuff can happen. So I think that it's, it's a great way to develop a neat market, but ultimately, focusing on retail pumps, if you have the, cap the capital and ability to do that, it gives you, again, a lot more control. Um, maybe I'm, I'm driving this point home, I'm a control freak. <laughs> we need to be control freaks. So I want to have control over all these things. Okay, we have five minutes, so we can answer a few more questions. I think, Kenji, you were um, Yeah, nice to have the CEO here in the other community. Um, so the DC co-ops, communities co-ops, they're kind of following your model, and one problem we well, the Victoria one has had is, is balancing collection with production. And I'm wondering if from your early days you faced that problem and how you went about to solve it. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to address that in just a moment. I just want to say real quick, you reminded me of something, which is I'm going to start talking about this model in terms of an island because I've been really impressed by that the whole time I've been here. Like, really, if we think of our communities as an island, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely kind of an isolationist thing there that I don't care for so much. but. We, our communities are islands in a lot of ways, and and we are all in a similar position one way or another as, as far as how long our supply will last. So I just wanted to address that real quick. But um, but as far as inventory, we have a just-in-time inventory production plant. That is 20 million headaches. I mean, it is not easy to do. When you grow, you have to grow everything at exactly the same time. Um, it requires you to be really creative with business partnerships, so you have built-in flexibility. It's required biofuel oasis to be really patient with us when we've been like, well, this is what we can do, and I know this is what you want. And one of the ways they make that work, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Jennifer, is just by having other suppliers that you can call on when we're not you know, able to supply you with everything, and kind of keeping things flexible, yet adding elements that provide stability, like one of the smaller ways we supply biofuel oasis is at a pump in San Anselmo in Marin County. We have an exclusive arrangement with biofuel oasis on that pump because we know we'll always be able to supply that. With, with their fuel in Berkeley, their demand is so high that sometimes our just-in-time system won't allow for us to supply all of it. Um, and as we move forward towards supplying fleets, we're gonna be going BQ9000. I'm pretty sure we're gonna be heading that direction later this year. And um, I'm not sure if that will allow us to continue with this just-in-time inventory method. I think that we're going to have to start thinking in terms of fuel lots, even though we feel like we've got all of these secondary ways of making sure that no fuel will get out um, that without being tested completely. I think that we're going to find that we're going to, we're going to need more storage and we're not going to be able to keep it that way. But we've been doing it for a long time, so if you guys are thinking it's a barrier, I would still suggest you try and get started that way. And just be creative, again, with the partnerships on, every, on the oil collection side and the di fuel distribution side. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I'll try to make this quick. Have you had any success working with like, the local economic development council to try and promote other businesses that would actually utilize your waste stream as their feedstock, especially, especially something like a local methane digester to, to take your stuff instead of having to drive it? No, but it's a great idea, and we have a fairly new water treatment plant that we might be able to encourage that with. Um, and the Economic Development Finance Corporation for our county has been really helpful. They gave us a few key loans, and we're going to be getting some big money from them probably for creating jobs. So uh, that's a great idea. Who's your competition? Um, it's never been the petroleum companies. I started out worrying about them, and I've never had to worry about them. Um, once we get into blends, that may change. The local, the local homegrown petroleum jobber, um, as they're called, uh, has been selling blends for years. So, so we'll see how that goes. Al almost all of our competition is, you know, for restaurant product, oil. and we're just going to have to keep getting better and better at our pitch, what we offer, everything. Um, 
grease traps is an area that we're having to learn a whole lot about. Yeah. The competition has that over us. I know time's almost over, but I would like you to repeat something um, about financing and about how you've done some of this. I think it's really critical for a lot of folks that are thinking about growing and thinking about how they finance this. Can you repeat what you were saying about local economic development and also kind of how you're approaching finance? Well, yeah, I was saying earlier during in the questions for, for Lyle's presentation um, that we haven't really been able to focus on the lobbying and stuff. But one of the things that we had to do very early and that I recommend for everybody is form a good relationship with your economic development finance corporation. Every community has something like that. They may be called something slightly different, but they're a, a nonprofit, often affiliated with or part of local government that is designed to make the, the road easier for the local small businesses. And they can help you get, if, if you don't qualify for an SBA loan, they can help you get a smaller loan and it's not going to require as much. Um, that's been absolutely critical to us. Uh, cool. All right. I'm getting the red light. <laughs>